The Mesoamerican Reef is the second largest barrier reef in the world, second only to the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. It stretches a thousand kilometers from the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, through Belize, Guatemala, and then finishes near the Bay Islands in Honduras. The reef system here in the Mesoamerican is relatively young compared to the Pacific, with only 65 species of stony coral and 500 species of fish, which is much less than the Pacific. Throughout the world, corals are in decline. However, in certain parts of the Mesoamerican, such as Roatan, the actual ecosystems are thriving and the healthy reefs are showing. There are 11 different species of lionfish found throughout the world, around the Indo-Pacific and other tropical areas. Over here in the Caribbean and Mesoamerican region, there are two species, the devil filefish and the red lionfish, which are causing havoc to the ecosystems. Found in the native habitat, they only grow to around 14 inches. Their population density is pretty normal. You don't really find them that abundant in regions. They reproduce at a normal rate, and they have predators. Things eat them, and they eat other things. The ecosystem is all in sync. Over in this part of the region, it is a very different story. They are wreaking havoc to our ecosystems, and we have to be proactive to try and remove them. There are different theories of how the lionfish reach this part of the world. The first one is ballast water. So boats that suck up water, move to another region, and drop the water off. The thing is, if they're coming from the Indo-Pacific region, most likely they're going to dump on the west coast of the states and not the east coast of the states. Also, if they travel through the Panama Canal, they're going to dump their water before they go through there. However, if, even if they do make it that far, most likely it's crustaceans, mollusks and algae that are going to survive inside a ship's hull, not necessarily a 14-inch lionfish. Another common theory is during Hurricane Andrew in 1992, six specimens escaped from the Biscayne Bay Aquarium, and like a Disney movie, they met up and reproduced. Not very likely, because the first specimens were found in 1985. Another popular theory of how the lionfish made it to this part of the world is the aquarium trade. Lionfish are a very beautiful fish. Often people will take films or photographs of them before they shoot them, which is totally fine. So, over in the Philippines, a small man paddles out in his dory and captures a lionfish. It then makes its way back to Manila, where it's then put on a plane and sent over to Florida, where it goes into an aquarium shop. Someone then goes and buys the lionfish and takes it to their house. Already you have a very resilient fish that has managed to withstand long journeys and hasn't actually died yet. This $50 lionfish then eats $200 of the other fish in the tank. As this person is an avid fish lover, he's not going to kill it, he's going to put it in the sea. And they estimate between 8 and 10 actual individuals started this whole thing. So yeah. Aquarium trade is the most likely one. Finally, another one, which could be a theory but has yet to be improved, is hotels with large aquariums, like the Atlantis Hotel in the Bahamas. They had lionfish, as obviously they're an attractive fish, and they had them in optimum conditions, so perfect temperature, amount of feeding for producing eggs. If they did not manage to filter the water successfully, these eggs would have then been pumped out into the sea, and unknowingly they would have been populating the whole of the Bahamas. This map, generated from information gathered by NOAA, shows the year-by-year -year spread from 1985 up to 2013. As you can see, for the first few years, it is just located in Florida. Then, in 1998, it spreads to the Bahamas. From then on, it's a rapid increase until it basically takes over the whole Mesoamerican and Caribbean region. It reached Roatan in 2009, in the far eastern region of the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago in 2012. I like to say this is the largest widespread invasion since man. There's nothing to control them. People like to call this an eradication program, but we are never going to eradicate them. It is simply educating people and putting a demand for the lionfish. There are very few limiting factors controlling the spread of the lionfish. The main one is temperature though. 10 degrees centigrade or 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very cold water, they stop reproducing, stop eating, and pretty much stop functioning. This region is very high up the northeast coast of the states. You'll see on the maps before, it's very shocking how far and how close to Canada the lionfish will spread. What also worrying is how far they're going to travel down the coast of South America, all the way past Brazil, which is a huge coastline expanse. So that's another worrying factor. Depth. They can actually survive in anything from a couple of inches in water down to beyond a thousand feet. There are four main methods of catching lionfish here in the Bay Islands. The first is with a spear, otherwise snorkeling or diving. Then you also have hook and lionfish. 
A lot of people actually catch them at around four to 500 feet when they bottom fish. Another method is the lobster traps, and they have these in Florida a lot, where lionfish is a bycatch. And finally, we have deep water fish traps with deep red snappers, and these are pulling up lionfish in huge numbers at 1,000 feet. The problem is we don't actually know what they're eating at 1,000 feet, whether they're eating slow moving, slow reproducing animals. So they may be changing the ecosystems before we even realize what's happening. Another big factor which is assisting the spread is actually lionfish can survive in low salinity water. That means they'll be living in estuaries and mangrove regions, which are important nursery grounds and breeding areas. Also, personally, you're not going to find me hunting lionfish in a low visibility area where there's bull sharks, because that's just a terrible idea. These lionfish also will be actually being able to traverse large areas where there's big outflows, such as the Amazon. So when there was a theory that they wouldn't actually be able to make it across that outflow, they're going to survive in these low salinity areas. Also, they can starve themselves for 30 days, so they will be able to traverse without feeding and make it these great distances. Lionfish have a very different method of reproducing them compared to any other fish in the Caribbean. The female actually pops out two gelatinous egg masses, which the male then fertilizes, and these then float on the surface for approximately 40 days during their hatching. Uh, these then can then colonize further regions. So even if we did just remove all the lionfish in our vicinity, we're just gonna have new eggs floating in from elsewhere. Also, nothing knows to eat these egg masses. Elsewhere, the birds and other fish on the surface will actually eat these eggs. But as nothing is used to these waves, nothing will eat them. Therefore, more eggs will actually reach maturity, and then it's an exponential growth with more lionfish reaching maturity, and therefore reproducing even further. The lionfish is in the same family as scorpionfish and stonefish. The venom from its spines can cause excruciating pain, but contrary to popular belief, it will not kill you. However, if you have extreme allergies to bee stings, you will need to make sure you always carry an EpiPen and try not to get one in the jugular either. There are 18 venomous spines to look out for on a lionfish. The first 13 run along the dorsal, and these are almost like hypodermic needles. Wearing gloves is illegal within the marine reserve, as people like to get handsy and touchy and have contact with the reef. However, in other places you can wear gloves, but then they will give you a full sense of security. A hypodermic needle safe glove works well when there's one spine there, but when there's 13, you may get stung. Also, you have one on either side of the pelvic fins. And finally, you have three anal fins here that are small, but yet will still inject you with the same volume of venom. Many people think the pectoral fins are venomous, but they're actually not. They actually use them to shepherd their prey, and then with their large mouths, they gulp in their food. The lionfish has a voracious appetite, eating everything in the Caribbean except for conch. We found lobsters, shrimp, crabs, fish, and octopus within their stomachs. Lionfish also like to target cleaning stations where small wrasse and shrimp clean other fish. This can have devastating consequences for the ecosystem, resulting in problems with parasites, diseases, and other unknown problems. To reduce the risk of getting stung, hold the lionfish by its mouth and cut off all the spines and fins. Once you've cut all the spines off, you can treat it like any other fish and you can even juggle it. Lionfish is a versatile white meat which can be prepared in a variety of ways. As the venom only rests in the spines, once the spines have been removed, you can eat any other part of it, unlike the Japanese blowfish. Spearfishing is actually illegal in the Bay Islands because people like to target certain species. So to be proactive, we teamed up with the National Fisheries Department to issue out licenses to divers and snorkelers. Initially, we just licensed up instructors and dive masters. But obviously, as they only have students and they have customers, they can't solely focus on hunting lionfish. So now it's open to the general public, as long as people sign that memorandum of understanding, do a workshop, and actually get in the water and do a test. This is a traditional pole spear. Though they do come available in six foot measures, there is no need for shooting lionfish with such a large spear because you're more likely to damage the reef. They are not pelagic species and they are not fast moving species. So this is totally adequate for both snorkeling and diving. These are very simple. Your thumb goes over here, your hand come up and you hold it there and then you release. You want you to have your hand over the black mark where you actually have enough power and also it won't slip anywhere underneath and you will not have a sufficient power. All spears are numbered and these correspond to your licenses. This is your spear and your spear alone. You cannot lend it or give it to other people. 
While your live fish permit is good for the balance, you may want to check other local regulations when in other countries, as some may need further permits, or some may have no regulations whatsoever. So these spears come with a cap. Most likely you lose them on your first day. If you do not wish to lose them, you can actually put a piece of string with a knot and actually tie it to the far end of your spear. Once you do lose it, not if you lose it, a piece of PVC pipe, a piece of garden hose, a piece of cork, or possibly a fruit, just so you're not stabbing people when you're getting on off the boat, you're not stabbing yourself in the leg when you jump in the water, and you're not putting holes in PCBs. Sometimes they'll have extra elastic. If you want to remove the elastic, you can actually push it through and actually fold it over. This will mean that your elastic is further up the spear and it means you'll have more power. That does help you sometimes. These elastics will often break just around in these two regions here. You can actually fix them once or twice by cutting it off and using a zip tie. Once it's broken on both ends, sadly that is the end of your elastic and you'll have to buy a new one. So the spears do have barbs on them, sometimes two, sometimes three. If you wish to make it a bit more effective, you can actually put it in a vise and use a hacksaw to put a few more notches on it, which makes it harder for the lionfish to swim off. The purpose of this project and others likewise are trying to promote the actual hunting of lionfish, but people need to understand it is a privilege, not their right, for them to actually get licensed. While we do want to promote the removal of lionfish, we do not want people to do it incorrectly and actually have direct damage to the reef. Many dive shops promote the magic meter, where people stay away from the reef. However, when hunting lionfish, you're going to get within that proximity, so we recommend that all hoses are tucked in neatly so they won't snag on anything. There is a certain type of diver that has something in the hand that is associated with hitting the reef. These are camera people. I'm not saying all photographers are terrible, but the majority of them are, because they become engrossed in what's through the lens and forget about their buoyancy. They often hit the reef and damage the reef, otherwise with their tank or their fins. You now, with a spear in your hand, can become that single-minded, focused person intent on killing the lionfish and forgetting about all spatial awareness. You need to always make sure you know where you are. Always ensure that you know where your tank is and where your fins are. Because by you hitting a piece of reef that took two years to only grow one inch, it's doing a lot more damage than that lionfish will ever do. So while you're out hunting lionfish and you spot a lionfish, you have to assess whether you can get into the position and get out without damaging the reef. If it is in a cavern or a cave, maybe you have a smaller friend with you who will be able to fit in that area. If not, leave it. The lionfish will stay in the same proximity until it eats all the fish in that area. Often during the mornings and evenings it is out hunting, swimming around, and makes it a lot easier to catch. During the daytimes, it will often be sitting on the bottom or actually using a swim bladder to go upside down underneath rocks. These are often hard to spot and you'll only see the white and black feathery parts of them. If you have assessed you can actually get to the lionfish then please move in. As I never want to promote people touching the reef, sometimes actually two fingers and only two fingers, touching dead coral or algal areas is okay. If you don't know what dead coral is, pretty much anything that looks like crustos, folios, or filament algae is okay. Anything beautiful and vibrant colored is often coral, so please do not touch that. Anything white is actually called bleached coral. Coral is actually a living organism. It consists of colonies of polyps. They have a symbiotic relationship with an algae called zooxanthellae. When they are stressed from temperature, pollutions, sedimentation, this algae then leaves and you're left with a transparent organism, which is the white. If this stressor is removed, the algae comes back and the coral fries. That's why you often see different color of corals, which are the same species. If, however, you put your hand on a white coral, you're pretty much dooming it to die, so please never ever touch a coral that's white. Obviously, when you touch, please do not use your whole hand, just two fingers. It is a very good way to control your body form, so you're not having to back paddle, you use your hands and feet. Just simply push away or lean in when you're doing it. But yet again, only two fingers and not a whole hand. When you find one lionfish, you may often find a hive of them, which could be five or ten. You'll probably want to shoot the largest one first, just in case they swim away. Most likely though, if they have not been harassed, they will all stay perfectly still and you can pick off one at a time. Before you shoot the first one, obviously you want to see if there's any nice living coral behind it. You do not want to shoot the lionfish and pin it into a barrel sponge, as yet again you are doing more damage to the reef than the fish will do. What you can gently do is actually use your spear and usher the fish into a better location. Doesn't mean you whap it in the back, it's a very simple movement of moving your spear 
and gently guiding it into a more suitable area. A lot of instructors, when lionfish first arrive, could actually use their hands to actually pull out the small lionfish to then demonstrate to their customers. Obviously, they would not want to clap their hands when they do this. Also, before you take the shot, if it is a large lionfish, you want to look for a sandy, rubbly area close by. The worst thing you can do is shoot a big lionfish, feel it fighting at the end of your spear, and actually let it swim off. What you want to do is actually use that sandy patch to pin the lionfish. Once you've pinned the lionfish down into the rubble area, you then assess the situation. If it is a successful kill, use the spear and the fish to actually push away and move away from the reef. Once you're there, you can celebrate, you can do a little somersault, you can do what you want. You're not going to damage the reef in any way. If you have shot it and it's not a good shot, maybe you'd like to bring another spear in to actually finish it off and then yet again move away. Please do not try and dispose or deal with your fish when you're in close proximity to the reef, as you most likely damage it, especially with your tank when you're moving back and forward. Once you've moved away, then you can safely remove the lionfish, put it in a bucket, or deal with it in any which way. Stupid people doing stupid things get stung. Firstly, if you have a lionfish on your spear, don't go to shoot his friend. By cocking the spear and bringing your hand towards the end, you're going to get stung. When you're putting the lionfish in a zookeeper or container, please put it head first. By putting it tail first, as the fish goes down, your hand will go down as well and you may end up getting stung. If you have a two foot arm, you have a two foot spear. There's no need to bring the other hand into the equation. So people will give you no sympathy if you pull out a little knife and try and finish off the lionfish. The spines do not have to be on the fish to sting you. The fish does not have to be alive to sting you. You have to respect both of those. The spines can easily get wedged between the prongs and that is the most common way people get stung. If you do get stung, most likely it'll be on your hand. Try and squeeze out whatever venom you can there and then. You will feel a venom pumping its way up inside your blood system. If you have a bracelet or a hair tie, try and use that to actually tie around the finger and squeeze out as much venom as possible. Hot water neutralizes the venom. So uh, if you have a thermos, you can use that. An outboard engine, you can have the spout there. If there is a rinse tank and it's a sunny day, you could even put your hand in there. When you get back to shore, have someone boil the kettle and test the water first. Immerse your hand in there and leave for up to four hours. For the pain, there's not much you can do, but for the swelling, try and take an antihistamine and this will alleviate the pain on that way. Now that you have your spear, you'll find out that you have some new friends out on the reef with you. The Nassau groupers and the mutton snappers will now follow you, waiting to be given food. When we first started this project, we just thought it was a good idea to actually feed the lionfish to these fish. Unfortunately, it's changed their natural behavior and now they're relying on us for food. If you see a lionfish in close proximity with a green moray, it's recommended you stay away. Green morays have a very good sense of smell but a very poor eyesight. So if you have a lionfish on your spear, you're just going to smell like one big dead lionfish and you may get attacked. You can use your spear as a kebab stick. You should be able to slot five or six lionfish onto the one spear. However, that is out of action and it's only a kebab stick. A common mistake which people do when hunting lionfish is they get too close with a spear. The lionfish does not know you're about to kill it. However, it is getting threatened by the spear so it starts to move. Rather than rush that first shot, just pull back and the fish will probably only swim two feet away. Move in again for the shot. If yet again you are too close, it will move away, but it will not flee. When you're shooting lionfish, please avoid shooting them in the head. They have a very hard bony plate and often the spears will actually bounce off them. Where you want to shoot them is just in the back of the neck. It is close to the spine and close to the heart. If you sever the spine, the fish will actually go flat out and it will lose its color for a few seconds. Congratulations, this is a kill shot. Obviously, you would have dragged the fish, pinned it down, noticed it was dead, and then pushed away. If you shoot a lionfish along the back region, this is all muscle. Lionfish are very hardy fish, and I found ones with 13 or 14 holes in them and missing pectoral spines. They will associate then the sound of bubbles to divers and to the pain. So they remember that bubbly people are bad people. Shooting the lionfish in the stomach, the spear will not usually stay in as there is no muscle. So the lionfish will come off, its dangly bits will come out, and the lobsters and crabs will have something to eat. However, sadly, you will not. With small lionfish, just please ensure it's a straight body shot. Like any sport, the more practice, the better you get. You do not just have to practice your shooting on lionfish. You can actually practice on shells, fruit, and other items you see in the water, obviously not other fish. Like any sport, the more practice, the better you get. I have my 50% days, and I have my 100% days. The difference is I don't touch the reef, and I don't damage the reef during those. 
it's just sometimes impossible to get a lionfish. While every region has its strategies for removing lionfish, if we can all work together and create an international program of hunting and managing lionfish, we can help reduce the numbers and help protect our already fragile reefs.